p.m. That would be very helpful. Um, I'm going to talk for the next, you know, 45 minutes to 50 minutes about the impact of captivity on the welfare of orcas, and this is a topic that is very near and dear to my heart. And I am going to offer you some facts and figures that we are aware of about the impact of keeping these animals in confinement, and then um, I will take some questions. So here we go. We believe that there are now about 70 orcas being displayed in eight countries. Um, as you can see at the bottom of the slide, that's the breakdown of where they are. Um, we say we think because, in fact, there are captures going on in Russia at this time, and I will speak to that later in the talk. Um, and so there's a, some um, uncertainty about exactly how many orcas are in captivity right now at this moment. But essentially, we believe there are 70. And that is um, uh, that the that number is made up of several that have just been recently captured. If you notice down at the bottom, it says Russia has 14. Most of those are recent. Well, they're all recent captures because the capture started up again in 2012. So, um, but some of these are literally from just this past summer um, in 2018. So it's it's a, a pretty devastating number. So I'm going to talk about their welfare and the impacts on their welfare, and then I'm going to talk about captures. So uh, the first element that is powerfully impacted by um, public display being confined in tanks is the amount of space these wide-ranging predators are given. So um, as you can see on this slide, the small print is you don't have to worry about it. Those are the references. I just want you to know that we do have um, scientific papers where these, da these data are coming from. So in the wild, orcas routinely swim multiple kilometers in a straight line, and they're capable of traveling as many as um, 225 kilometers, roughly 140 miles, a day for 30 to 40 days without rest. Now, this is down in the Antarctic. Uh, a more typical day for an orca, say, in the North Atlantic or North Pacific might be 25 miles, 50 miles in a day. Um, but I have seen orcas in the North Pacific travel about 100 miles in a day. And so these are animals that are very kinetic. They're very dynamic. They routinely dive to depths in excess of 500 meters, which is, you know, 50, you know 1,500 feet, basically. Um, and a shallow dive is in excess of 7 meters or, or 20 feet. So that's a shallow dive. They are capable of diving much deeper than that, and they usually dive up to 200 meters a dozen times a day. And um, in some populations, they'll go down to 150 meters or more at least once every five hours. Now, this next slide is of a schematic. This is um, actually a tagged animal who was tracked going down in this dive, and then somebody turned it into this graphic. But these are actual data from an animal named K33. You can see that up in the upper right-hand corner there. And he was tagged, and, and then the track shows how he dives down and um, comes up near the surface on the right-hand side of the, of the slide. And that whole, that whole track is about five minutes. So this is a five-minute dive. He goes down to 525 feet, or 160 meters, and he does something down there. He's not just laying down at the bottom, you know, doing nothing. He's moving around. He's probably foraging. He's probably chasing fish down at that depth. Now, he'll do this four or five times a day. That little blue section, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but that the little blue section in the corner of the graph, in light blue um, cube, is actually SeaWorld. So that's the, the tank at SeaWorld. And that's where, you know, five to ten animals will live 24-7, 365, when in fact they're capable of doing this dive several times a day in their normal in the normal lives. And if you see at the bottom, typical tanks are one ten thousandth of one percent the size of their natural home range. And I honestly believe that the contraction of the space that they're given is a large part of the problems that they face in terms of their health, in terms of their behavior, in terms of their mental state when they're in captivity. This is Lolita. This is the Miami Sea Aquarium in Florida. Um, this is the smallest orca tank in the world, so I'm not trying to imply that this is, you know, typical. But it is where she has lived for the past almost 50 years. And don't let that fool you. That doesn't mean that this is adequate for her. What it means is that she's really tough. There was another orca that lived with her um, who died 
30 plus years ago. Um, so he didn't make it in this little tiny tank. As you can see, she's barely longer than it is wide. And, or it's barely wider than she is long, is what I meant to say. And so you can just see that she really doesn't have a lot of space. It's also only 20 feet deep. And so she doesn't, she's not really even capable of diving down and getting vertical, um, vertical in, in, in the water column. So this is really, really a tiny spot. And then over to the right, you might see it again. I'm using my cursor. If you can't see it, I'm sorry. Um, there's a dolphin in there with her. So she's lived without an orca companion since 1980 when her companion Hugo died. This is legal in the United States. It actually isn't in terms of its space, but the US government declines to do anything about this and has essentially given Miami Sea Aquarium a pass on this space. But basically, this is not, um, I hope, acceptable to anybody, but in fact, we have orcas living like this in the United States. Social groupings, so their social environment, is the next problem they face. So this is Kiska. She lives completely alone. She doesn't even have any dolphin companions in marine land in Canada, up in Ontario. And so again, these are amongst the most social animals on the planet. They are probably even more social than human beings. Um, in some populations, they live in very tightly bonded family groups. In others, um, they are more dependent on more fluid social dynamics, but nevertheless, hunt and socialize and live in groups of at least 20 to 30 animals. Um, so this is, this is not normal for them to live completely alone. And in fact, Kiska, who's a, um, an older female, she would be the matriarch of her, of her family at this point in her life. And so for her to live like this is really, I think, quite troubling and um, ethically. And also in terms of her mental state, I'm really not sure whether she's even completely sane anymore. Environmental quality and complexity. These are animals that are the top predators in the ocean. They roam, as I've just been telling you, very, very great distances. The ocean is an extremely complex environment with lots of different sounds, lots of different um, animals that they will encounter, both prey and not prey, um, vegetation, storms. It is an extremely dynamic and complex environment. And then this is what they get in captivity. Basically, it's a concrete box. There's really no features down there. They might have toys, plastic, rubber, um, rope uh, as toys for them to interact with, but those are static, static objects that, that don't move the way their prey do, that don't move the way all the other animals in their environment would do if they were out in the ocean. So this is not stimulating. This is not um, going to grab their attention. And these are very intelligent animals. And so when they get bored, that's not just, oh, I'm bored. That's scary time for the trainers and for the other whales because they will come up with ways to keep themselves occupied. It is probably one of the reasons why many trainers have been injured and four people have been killed in captivity is because these animals are acting out of frustration because this, this concrete box is really quite boring. Um, this is another uh, look at, a, at a, uh, an orca enclosure. This one is in France. Again, it's just a swimming pool with plexiglass windows and pretty much nothing in it. Um, they do interact sometimes with the gulls and birds that land on the water because, again, they're very bored and it's better than nothing. But it's often not actually great for the birds because they've been known to kill them. And it's also not normal for them to have to resort to that to keep themselves occupied when they're in normal habitat. And finally, they are very restricted in their behaviors. Again, this is a very large top predator um, in, the, um, in the ocean environment. And when they're in this concrete box where they get trained to do tricks and so on, um, they don't have any choices. They're basically active when the, when the show requires them to be, or when their training requires them to be, or when their trainers require them to be. And otherwise, they're left to interact amongst themselves, and it's the same orcas every day. Sometimes, as you see with Kiska, no orcas every day. And so they, they basically are, um, again, bored. And I, I think that word is, is unfortunate because it sounds so petty, but it actually, when you think about it, boredom can kill because boredom leads to depression and frustration and it can cause stress and ultimately you know, health problems. So we've got the top marine predator. 
This is uh, mammal eating orcas hunting in Patagonia and Alaska on the lower right. The upper left there is taking a, a young pup, a sea lion pup, off the beach. This is a very risky but very, um, you know, challenging and, and um, skilled hunting technique where they have to not beach themselves and yet grab these pups off of the beach. The lower right there is a, an orca hunting in Alaska. That's a doll's porpoise, a small four and a half foot um, cetacean that it hunts and it just shoots them right out into the air by ramming them. It's a very, um, again, these are top predators. N you know, they, nothing, nothing beats an orca. Um, a lot of young kids I, I often ask me, you know, if it was a fight between a great white shark and an orca, who would win? You know, an orca, because an orca has a really big brain and can think and, sh and plan, and the shark is kind of, you know, I won't say mindless, but, you know, they pretty much just um, have <laughs> one speed. And so this is something that they plan, they, they carry out, and it's their job. It's their job out in the wild. Now, what get, happens in captivity is they just have food dropped into their mouth. So this head up, mouth open, begging behavior is, is what you see in captivity. This is unique to captivity, this stat, this, um, uh, what, what I'm trying to think of. Um, the, the, the way he's holding his head and the way he's looking up into the sky is actually, you only see that in captivity. Spy hopping is a natural behavior, but they don't have their mouths open because they are, in fact, looking around at, at the horizon trying to look for, for um, landmarks and so on. What he's doing here, or she is doing here, is she's actually looking up into the sun, which is bad for her eyes, and waiting for fish to drop into her mouth. So this animal that is very dynamic and hunting all the time is reduced to, you know, mouth open beggar. This is fish herding in Norway. So these, there are more than one orca in this photo. You can sort of see one way off in the distance here. There's a white eye patch there. They are cooperating and putting this herring into what they call a herring ball. And they are then taking turns going through the herring ball and grabbing herring out of the, um, the grouped fish. And so this is, a, again, a very skilled, less dangerous um, hunting technique for orcas that specialize in eating herring. So some orcas eat, feed on fish. Some orcas feed on other marine mammals. This is a cultural difference, and all of that is lost in captivity. They do not have, well, they have captive culture, if you want to think of it that way, but they come from different populations, from Iceland, from the North Pacific, from off the coast of Japan. These are all historical sources for animals that are now descendants of, and have been bred in captivity, and they don't have their ancestors' culture. They've lost all of that. They don't hunt. What is basically their job in the wild is taken away from them. They have no career, and they are basically left to be active when their trainers want them to be, to do nothing pretty much at all. For example, all night long, they do nothing. They are, in fact, um, forced to, quote, unquote, sleep at night. They rest at night, and they're active during the day in captivity. But that's not how it works in, um, in the wild. This herringball hunting technique could happen in the middle of the night because they have echolocation. They don't have to rely on their vision. And so what you get in captivity, again, this is Lolita in the Miami Sea Aquarium. You saw the aerial view of her enclosure. This is what it looks like at the ground level. And she's performing with the Hulk and Spider-Man and Captain America. It, it, it's a cartoon. It's a circus. And it's inappropriate to um, use these animals in this way, to exploit these animals in this way. Um, I'm looking at a question, just in case you folks are wondering. Um, which type mostly end up in captivity? Well, because they were nervous about um, what the mammal-eating orcas might do with trainers in the water when they used to do water work, which meant getting in the water and swimming around with the orcas, is the vast majority of the orcas that are in captivity were caught in the wild and were fish eaters or are descendant of fish eaters. Um, however, early on in the 1960s, they did take a couple of uh, mammal eaters and so there is some mammal-eating um, genes in, in, the, in the mix in the captive population, but it, it, very diluted at this point because of the vast majority of orcas that um, were captured from the wild and put into captivity were fish eaters. The impacts of captivity on orcas. So now I'm going to get a little bit into some of the things that we do know about that we've measured. Um, perhaps not surprisingly, there's not as much data as you might think there should be. Because the industry, in fact, doesn't really want that, those data to be collected. They've been very reluctant to allow academics and outside researchers to come in and measure the impact of captivity on orcas. What data we have 
are very often take, um, taken without their cooperation using you know, remote methodologies like cameras and, and, and recordings. And also, um, they've done some work themselves, but very, very little. And so uh, what I have is what we, what we know. Um, the, the strongest indication that there's something going on, um, I'll get to your question in a moment, Kenyon. Um, I see it. It says, do orcas sleep? I'll get to that in a moment. Um, the strongest indication we have that there is a problem here um, with these animals in terms of um, neurotic, repetitive behaviors, which are called stereotypies, and also just damaging behaviors, is their teeth. So this is a, a stranded animal, which is why it looks that way. So this animal is dead. But you can see its teeth in the lower jaw and also in the upper jaw. You can just see the tips of them, you know, at the upper, upper lip here, are beautiful, conical, you know, pointy teeth. So that's typical for a salmon-eating orca in the Pacific Northwest. And then you see what happens to them in captivity. See these teeth? They're worn right down to the gum line. And you can actually see open holes here and here. The, these open holes are cavities, just like you would have if your teeth were drilled out. And that's what happened here. The teeth were being worn down from the animal chewing on the walls, the concrete walls, and snapping their teeth at the gate so they break the lower, the lower pictures of an animal with many broken teeth. And basically, this happens because they are chewing and, and snapping at the metal gates, chewing on the concrete walls. And they end up with these open holes, which are just like our cavities. They are avenues for pathogens to get into their system. They end up getting sick. And we don't know very much about the health uh, ramifications of these bad teeth. But in every other mammal we know of, including ourselves, bad teeth almost always equals bad health. And so these teeth are bad. And the uh, public spay industry basically tells us, oh, that's normal. And it is true that there are some orcas out there in the wild who have teeth like this on the upper picture, worn down to the gum line. But that is a population level thing. There are populations that have that kind of teeth. And it seems to be a result of the way they feed. So they are feeding in a way or on prey that results in this wear on their teeth. And it may very well shorten their lives. They may have greater success, reproduce fast, and live shorter lives because their teeth become like that. Whereas in captivity, breakage is very common. It is not common in the wild. And they don't eat anything that would wear their teeth this way. So why do they have bad teeth? And again, it could probably, it almost certainly translates into health problems. It's because they do these neurotic behaviors. They should look like the teeth on the left. They're eating fish, dead fish for that matter, that go right down their gullet. They just get dropped. Remember that photograph? I showed you of the whale just getting fish tossed into its mouth. Well, they should look like the whale on the left, and they don't. They look like the whales on the right. So there's something really wrong about the dental health of these animals. This is a, again, you don't have to worry about what it says. It's a paper. It's one of the only papers that has been published on the bad dental um, condition of orcas in captivity. It was done without the cooperation of the industry. Folks went in and took a high resolution photographs of the open mouths of various captive whales. And they found, again, in the upper right, you'll see all the uh, two pictures of bad teeth, open holes from drilling. And unlike, of course, our cavities, which get filled with amalgam, you can't fill an orca's teeth with amalgam because they're in the water all the time. So they just stay open, and they just remain avenues for pathogens, for diseases to get into their system. And about 70% of the animals in captivity have some dental problems. And about 25% of the animals in captivity have serious dental problems. So this is a very clear indication that captivity is resulting in something that is almost certainly bad for their health. And the industry is not studying it, which I find very, very disturbing. Um, in answer to the question about do orcas sleep, cetaceans, whales and dolphins and porpoises, don't actually sleep the way we do. They, they do rest. They absolutely need to rest, just like any mammal does. But because they're in the water and they are air breathers and they don't want to drown, if they fall fully asleep, they will drown. They actually breathe voluntarily. They don't have an autonomic breathing response the way we do. So we, we continue to breathe when we're asleep or unconscious for that matter. They actually have to stay partially awake to continue to open and close their blowhole and breathe. And so they're always slowly swimming forward and they are half asleep, if you will. They shut off half their brain. They literally close one eye. And then at some point, they switch the side of the brain that's asleep. And they open the other eye. And that's how they rest. And they're always swimming. 
sometimes so slowly, it's almost like they're not, but they are gently moving forward. In captivity, they spend an enormous amount of time not moving at all. They just float at the surface. It's called logging because they're floating at the surface like a log, and it is literally uh, a behavior that is um, excessive in captivity. It does occur in the wild. When they're socializing or resting, they sometimes float in the, in, at the surface for a, a minute or two at the most. In captivity, they can float like that for up to three hours. And so again, this is a, a huge difference between the wild and captivity that is not being studied. Dorsal fin collapse. Everybody talks about this and everybody asks about this. And um, I'm going to give you a little bit of a background on it. Hang on, I've got a couple more questions. So what is the usual lifespan? Oh, I'm going to get to the lifespan, so don't, don't jump the gun there. Um, and I, and you'll, you'll hear all about that in a second. Um, Kenyon is asking, do they literally shut off one side of the brain to sleep, and is it the side that the eyes close? It's actually the other side that's least active, the other side of the brain, because brains are cross-wired. And so, you know, when you, it, what's on the left side of your brain is, is controlling the right side of your body. And so, um, basically, they're closing their right eye when their left side of their brain is asleep and the other way around. Um, there you go. And, and so they are, in fact, um, just resting half of their brain at a time, and that's why their eyes closed. So um, it was discovered in captivity. This was actually something that was discovered in captivity. So there has been some good science done on captive animals, but it was um, on bottlenose dolphins and all the cetaceans seem to have the same um, system. So this is a, a I, I actually don't know, I think that's Ulysses. He's in San Diego. He's still alive. Um, but, but actually, um, the dorsal is flopping to the left, so it might actually even be tilicum. Um, but anyway, the uh, Ulysses dorsal fin flops to the right. As you can see, it looks like, you know, licorice or taffy that's just sort of flopped over. It's not a very good description of it because the dorsal fin grew that way. This whale was born normal. His dorsal fin was born normal, sticking straight up as a baby. But as he grew, because he spent so much time at the surface, we think, and again, we don't actually know the mechanism for the dorsal fin collapse because it has not been studied. And I keep saying that. I really want to drive that home for you. Why hasn't this stuff been studied? These animals have been in captivity since 1964, but it hasn't. Anyway, so this whale was born normal. His dorsal fin started to collapse when it reached some critical height to width ratio, and it grew that way. So as you can see, it's not perfectly flat on his back. If you walk up to it and you tried to move it, it would actually be relatively rigid. It grew that way, and, and we believe it's because they spend so much time at the surface, just like this whale is right now. He's in the air. He's beached himself for a trick. This is a behavior they're taught as part of the performance. So he's in the air, and his dorsal fin just is pulled over by gravity. Females also have dorsal fins that are partially collapsed, but because they're smaller, their dorsal fins are smaller, they don't collapse completely the way the males do. And here's something you should be aware of. They do, this does happen in the wild. This whale is clearly in the wild. And look what his dorsal fin looks like. It doesn't look the same as the, the, the collapsed fin on the, on the left. It is collapsed, but it's not the same kind of collapse. This is because when it happens in the wild, we believe it's due to injury or uh, illness. We've actually seen dorsal fins collapse from injury. They're perfectly normal and tall and straight. And for example, people shoot at these animals still in the wild, and somebody got a bullet wound and it got gangrene, essentially, and it collapsed. And we actually watched that process. And then it healed, and it was collapsed like this. Uh, at least two whales had their dorsal fins collapse, collapse after the Exxon Valdez oil spill. So somehow or other, the exposure to the oil caused this collapse. So when it happens in the wild to about 1% to 5% of males in the wild, so very small percentage, it's almost always after an injury or an illness or exposure to toxins. It happens to 100% of the males in captivity. So again, it is a clear difference between captivity and the wild. It may have health implications. Again, we don't know because it has not been studied. It's probable it's, it's, it doesn't actually have any health implications for the captive um, orcas, but it might because it is a heat conductor, the dorsal fin. That's why they have it. They're large animals. Females need a dorsal fin that's as big as it is. Males are larger, and so they need a bigger dorsal fin. And it's a heat exchanger. It's a way for them to regulate their body temperature. So when it flops over like this, maybe that's uh, you know, affected in some way. We don't know. And, and whatever physical process is going in, on inside the dorsal fin to actually cause that collapse, 
is also potentially bad for them in some way, and we don't know. And again, we don't know because it hasn't been studied. This is what a dorsal fin is supposed to look like. This is a male dorsal fin out in the wild, straight and tall, because he spent most of his life as he was growing up under the water. And the water pressure, the water column, helped keep it straight and tall as it was growing, and it grew that way. Again, if you went up to it and you tried to shake it, it would be a little flexible, but not very much. It wouldn't be floppy. And so that is how it grew. And it grew up straight and tall because he spent most of his life underwater. And it can go up to five to six feet in height. There's no bone, no cartilage. It's just connective tissue and fatty tissue. And that's how it's supposed to look. Finally, getting to the question that somebody asked earlier about survivorship and longevity and so on, what we know is um, a bit of a mixed bag because the data sets in captivity and the data sets in the wild are not equivalent. We have some very good data on a few populations in the wild, and we have a very good idea of how they survive and how long they live um, once they pass infancy. So infancy is just, uh, defined here as the first six months of life. And the reason we don't know much about those first six months is because they are not in the view of researchers in those first six months. They appear on the scene where the researchers are, are able to go in good weather um, when they're about six months old. And so we do not actually know how many calves are born and don't make it to six months. So from six months onward, we have excellent data on these few populations in the wild. And based on those data, we have some idea of comparing them to captive animals, where we have all the data, right? Because we know from the minute they're born to the minute they die. And of course, a lot of animals have the data, right? Because we know from the minute they're born to the minute they die. And of course, a lot of animals um, are still alive who were born in captivity because they only started successfully giving birth in 1985. And these animals live for decades. And so a lot of the animals that were born in captivity who are still alive could get even older than they already are. And so we're not, neither data set is complete is my point. But we have some good data, like I said, and here's what we know. We know that in the wild, about 81% of those animals that make it past six months of age reach sexual maturity, and about 46% of the females who make it to six months of age reach menopause. And menopause, I'm sorry, about 45% here. Um, menopause is a very unusual um, uh, condition, is a very unusual um, phenomenon in the animal kingdom. We obviously go through menopause as human beings. This is where you know, we basically continue to live past the ability to, to reproduce. Orcas do it too, and in fact, there's only a couple of other species that may have menopause. Generally speaking, you only live as long as you can reproduce. You have no value biologically if you can't reproduce anymore. But something about human beings and orcas and pilot whales and a couple of other species, they have value beyond their ability to reproduce, the females. Males, of course, continue to be able to reproduce into their old age, even in human beings. So basically what you have here is reproductive um, old age um, is achieved before the rest of you gets old. And it's, it's, a, it's called senescence, basically. And it's really a pretty fascinating um, phenomenon. But 45% of the females who make it to six months of age reach menopause. In captivity, only 46% sorry, only 46 of the animals who um, uh, are born in captivity, and this is, these are captive-born animals, um, reach sexual maturity. And only 7% so far have made it to menopause. And remember, I told you they started holding these animals in captivity in 1964. So um, menopause is at about 40. So there should have been a lot more females who made it to 35, 40, 50 years old, and they didn't. There's a couple of females who are over 50. That is it. Everybody else, had, there's other, mm, five or so that have made it past 40, and everybody else died before 40. And that is not the way it is in the wild. In the wild, the mean life expectancy is 50 for females and 30 for males. That's the mean life expectancy. That's how long you can expect to live at six months of age. And that is not how it works in captivity. They, they die in their 20s, their 30s, they're, they're teens all the time. Um, Kayla uh, just died. You may have read about that in the news. She was 30 years old. And so in the wild, she would have been in the prime of her life. But in captivity, she's already dead. And the oldest captive-born orca currently, the oldest there ever has been, she's currently alive, but um, she's also the oldest that has ever been, 
um, was born in 1988, and she's now 30 year, 30, she'll be 31 this year. Um, and she, and her, Kayla was actually born only two months before her, and she just died. So Orchid is the whale that is currently alive today, is 31, going to be 31 this year, and she was captive born in 1988, and we'll see how long she lives, but I, I actually don't think she'll live um, much past 35. And that's just a prediction, but it, it's just, it's the odds are against her. And then you see at the bottom here, survivorship rates in captivity are comparable to populations in the northeastern Pacific, the, uh, the populations up in the Pacific Northwest, Washington, Oregon, and on up into British Columbia that are endangered or threatened. So basically, they do have comparable um, survivorship patterns, you know, how many live from year to year. But those populations in the wild are actually facing threats that are impacting their ability to survive. So what I'm trying to say is captivity seems to have similar impacts on the survivorship of orcas as poor habitat does, as starvation does, you know, because they're facing food shortages in, in Washington State, for example. So it, it's not something to write home about that the captive orcas are living, um, are surviving as well as the Pacific Northwest populations. That's not something to write, write home about because the Pacific Northwest populations, particularly in Washington, are facing a lot of threats, and they're not doing that well. Um, in, in British Columbia, they're doing better, and that's great. But again, then you'd have to ask if they're doing as well as those populations, although they're also threatened, by the way. Um, why aren't they doing better? Because they're not facing the threats that these orcas in the Pacific Northwest are facing. They're not facing food shortages. They're not facing pollution. Um, they're not facing, you know, noise and ship strikes. Why are they not doing any better than the orcas in the Pacific Northwest? I hope that makes sense. It's a little bit confusing. Um, there's a dog in the office. That's why there's a barking dog in the background. Um, Research, conservation, education, these are um, words that the public display industry uses a lot to justify its, um, its practices. Um, if you see the, what's written here, it says only 11% of published peer-reviewed papers on orca research come from captive specimens, come from samples um, in captivity. That's not great. That means pretty much 90% of the research that's published in the, in the scientific literature is coming from wild studies, from studies out there in the wild. Um, we now have greater and greater technology, you know, GoPro cameras, drones, wow, those are great, um, tags that are quite small and easy to put on and come off very easily and don't do a lot of damage to the animals, suction cup tags that do no damage to the animals. These are things that we now have to study them in the wild. We can get into their world. We can go down and get that track I showed you of the diving K33. Those are things we can do now that we didn't used to be able to. So. What value is there for captive animals and their research? I mean, we learned a few things that were very important from captive animals, like how long their gestation was and so on, but we know those things now. We don't need to keep learning them. And so what value do captive animals now have for research? That's the question to ask. Um, and then um, the uh, industry continues to claim that um, captive cetaceans are vital to research and conservation, despite this huge discrepancy in um, where the research is coming from. Captive facilities are out in the wild. The last thing I want to talk to you about, and then I'll take some more questions, is the capture process. And the reason this is still relevant, even though a lot of the animals that are now in captivity were born there, is because it hasn't stopped. Unlike with some animals that are in zoos, like, I don't know, zebras, where they pretty much don't take them from the wild anymore. They're, they are all bred in captivity now. Cetaceans, whales and dolphins, they are still captured from the wild in many parts of the world. Not in the United States. There hasn't been a capture from U.S. waters since 1993. Um, and not in Europe. Uh, there haven't been any captures from the wild there for, you know, decades. But in Asia, in the Far East, in Russia, um, in the Caribbean even, in Cuba, for example, they are still capturing these animals. And not just, uh, not just orcas, this refers to all of the um, uh, whales and dolphins that are held in captivity. But the orca captures in particular are here on this slide. And as you can see, there are at least 15 orcas now that we are, have confirmed are in China, and they all came from Russia, from the wild. China has a growing and expanding public display industry, dolphinariums, zoos, aquariums, what, what they refer to as ocean theme parks. 
there are now 74 or 75 operational um, marine theme parks in China, and most of them are only about two or three years old. So they are building them as fast as I'm talking. <laughs> and there are about 25 more being built right now. So within a very short period of time, there are going to be 100 operational marine theme parks in China. And the problem is they don't know what they're doing. They are unable to breed them successfully yet. There's been a few birds. In fact, they just had three belugas be born, but I don't expect them to survive. They still get most of their dolphins, their bottlenose dolphins from Japan, and their belugas and their orcas are coming from Russia. The orcas just started being captured again, as you can see there, in 2012. There was a capture in 20, 2003, but it wasn't successful. But in 2012, they started capturing them successfully, and just since 2012, they probably caught about 30 of them probably from a population that has fewer than 300 animals. So in just seven years, they have caught 10% of the population. This is from a long-lived, slow-to-reproduce mammal. It's not sustainable. And not only is it not sustainable, but they're probably killing a few animals every year that they take you know, five live ones. One or two have died because they get entangled in a net and drown and so on. And so it's even more. It's not just 30. It's probably more like 40. And so it's more than 10% of the population if, in fact, the numbers are that small, which we believe they are. There's only about 250 of these orcas that they are targeting in this capture operation. There are more orcas in Russia, but those aren't the ones they're capturing. The ones they're capturing are, in fact, mammal eaters. Remember we were talking earlier about how most of the orcas in the West, in the United States and Europe, are descended from fish eaters. Well, the ones that are being caught in Russia are mammal eaters. And that is very scary to me. I really worry about the trainers who are handling these animals in China, in Russia, because they don't know what they're doing. And so they don't know what they're doing with young animals that were raised to eat other mammals. And I don't think that's safe. Um, and then, you know, they're not breeding them because they don't know how to do that. They don't know how to successfully provide them with the conditions that will actually allow them to breed. And so we've got the situation where they just keep wanting to get them from the wild. And so what happened, so the trade between Russia and China is increasing. I am working in China as well. That's what this report cover is for. We have actually uh, started a whole campaign in China to try to address the demand for these animals. But we're also looking at the supply in Russia. And this is a photograph from this past summer. That box with the tarp on it on the deck is has got a, a orca cap inside of it. And basically, they started these captures, as I said, in 2012, but they stopped for a couple of years. There were no captures in 2016 and 2017 because, I won't get into it, but it, there was a bit of a scandal with how the permits were being issued. And so they had a moratorium. But then in 2018, this past summer, they allowed the captures to start up again. And instead of taking two or three, if you recall from the past slide, um, see how it says, one, two, one, four, two, maybe eight in 2015. Um, single digit numbers. Well, this summer, this past summer, they caught 11. And those animals are currently being held in holding pens in a town called Nakotka, which is near Vladivostok in the far east of Russia. And this is what it looks like from the air. Remember I said drones, really great um, new technology. Well, there's a drone shot. And what you can see here are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 pens, and then some pens over here. And you wonder what these are with the, with the covers on them. But look at the ones without the covers. There are these objects in them. Well, those are beluga whales. And they're young you know, calves, basically. And there's about, look at that, there's about 10 in each one. So how many would that be? It would be roughly 90. So we believe that there were 90 at one point now. We know there are only 87, so we're worried that three have died. And 11 orcas, and they're the ones that are underneath these awnings. They're covered. And so the problem is, and this picture was from um, November, I believe, this whole area now is covered in ice. This is Russia. This is basically Siberia. And, and this whole area is covered with ice, and they are breaking up the ice on the surface of these enclosures to keep the animals ice-free so they can breathe. But they are freezing. They are young animals, babies, basically, who were taken from their mothers, and it's just too cold for them. They would have migrated with their mothers, with their families, 
to slightly warmer waters. It's not that they can't handle you know, freezing water, but only when they're older. These are young calves with no other adults with them, and they aren't able to move very much and keep active in these small enclosures. So this is a pretty bad situation, and we are monitoring this on a daily basis. But this capture operation is causing such a scandal in Russia that we hope it will end simply because they don't want to keep receiving so much negative publicity as a result of this. But this is what the industry does to these animals. It isn't, I feel, entirely the fault of China's facilities. They're just trying to copy what they see happening in the United States and Europe. And so I think that we bear some responsibility for what they're, they're copycatting you know, in, in uh, the East. You'll be familiar, perhaps, with the film Blackfish. I do recommend that you, you watch it if, if you haven't already. Um, it's available still, I think, on Netflix, but you, know, you can get it as a DVD. And then these are two books, Death at SeaWorld by David Kirby and Beneath the Surface by John Hargrove, who's in Blackfish. He's one of the trainers in Blackfish. Um, if you want to learn more about the background of some of the things I've been talking to you about today. And then I did a TEDx talk, um, I believe it was in 2015, so four years ago now, on similar themes that I've just talked to you, obviously, um, four years ago, so not as much information um, in the scientific sense, but more information about the history of these animals in captivity. The photo um, on the screen in the back of my, uh, I'm standing right there, in the back there um, at, at the screen capture is of a whale named Candu, who was killed, who killed herself basically accidentally by so violently attacking another um, orca in the enclosure with her that she broke her own jaw and she severed an artery and she bled out. And that violent uh, encounter, that violent interaction is almost certainly one that wouldn't have happened in the wild because the subordinate animal, who is still alive, her name is Corky, um, she would have just run away. She would have been able to escape or to elude or to evade the anger of Candu, but because she had nowhere to go, Candu actually rammed into her with full force. Corky got bruised up but survived. Candu actually broke a jaw and died. So this is another sort of um, element of captivity that we don't think about too often. You know, these are not saints. These animals I do have hierarchies. They do get angry at each other. But their violent interactions are relatively low level sometimes, for the most part, because they can escape into three dimensions. Corky could have dived down. She could have swum away if she'd been out in the ocean. But because she was in a concrete box, she had nowhere to go. So um, if you do want to um, see my TEDx talk, it's on YouTube. And it's um, Let's Throw Shamu a Retirement Party. That's my email address. Um, I do have a community page on Facebook from the Dolphin's point of view. And I'm on Twitter as F-R-D-O-L-P-H-I-N-P-O-V from Dolphin Point of View. And um, those are my community uh, social media accounts for talking about this issue. So obviously the Animal Welfare Institute, which is where I work, also has their own social media. So I'm happy to take any questions for the last 15 minutes. Hang on, I'm looking. Ah. Will the dorsifin ever straighten out? No, it will never straighten out. It is, um, we believe that if they are put into, you know, a, a larger space in cold water um, and um, are allowed to spend a, a more normal amount of time below the surface, that it might straighten up a little bit because, um, remember, I told you it's not floppy but it, it's a bit flexible, and the warmer the dorsal fin gets because it's just fatty and connective tissue, it literally can soften, then it, 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 it bends a little bit more. So if it actually hardens a little bit because it's cold the way it's supposed to be and you know, supported by the water column, it might straighten up a little bit, but we're talking about just a few degrees. So no, it'll never straighten up. It, it, is, it, is, it grew that way. Like I said, it actually is shaped that way now because it grew like that so it's not going to change its shape. Um, how many orcas are left in the, in the world? Um, actually we, we don't know. Um, we've never known how many orcas there are in the world. Um, it's hard to count them. They live all over the place. They live in the Arctic. They live in the Antarctic. They live at the tropics. It's hard to count them. 
but they are top predators and in many places um, they are because they're top of the food chain they're also accumulating toxins and pollutants and they're not very healthy so in other places they are quite healthy and they're doing very well like in the Antarctic so far they're doing pretty well so we don't really know conservatively very much guesstimate anywhere from 50,000 to 100,000 maybe 150,000, who knows, somewhere in there. And that might sound like not very many, but it's a normal number for a top predator. As you go up the food pyramid, if you will, um, energy transfer is less efficient. And so you have lots and lots of herbivores and not so many carnivores. And so when you're at the top, top, top of the carnivore um, pile, um, there are not as many of you. So um, they're not considered endangered as species, but there's a couple of populations, including the one in Washington that are considered in danger. Orcas communicate with the most wonderful vocalizations you've ever heard. They have, um, we believe what's known, uh, we believe that what they have is a language, that they actually um, are communicating fairly complex ideas uh, through their, not just their vocalizations, but their body posture and their body gestures. Uh, it's, it's probably quite complex and we haven't figured it out yet. Um, but their vocalizations are within our hearing range, and they are very, very beautiful. And if you ever get the chance to uh, hear um, a recording of orca um, sounds, you should do it. It's not, I wouldn't call them songs, like uh, humpback whale songs, because um, songs are, as you might imagine, they're composed, and so they change over time. Um, humpbacks actually are composing music um, over the course of a season, and a song will change over, over the course of time. Um, orcas have a language, so it's like words, or what we believe, um, and so they're the same all the time, but they are different for each family and for each population, so they have what we call dialects, so in literally different languages. Um, again, it's culture. They are taught this language. It's not like bird song or bird calls where it's stereotyped. Again, that's the same thing over and over again, um, and it's somewhat instinctive. You know, a robin will sing a robin song whether it's ever been exposed to other robins. Whereas um, these orcas are actually taught how to speak their language. What are killer whales known for? I'm not really sure what that means. Um, I think they're um, known for their intelligence and their sociality. They're just the most incredibly social animals. Um, I was actually studying that. I am an orca biologist. I actually studied them out in the wild. And what I was interested in was their um, social structure because males in the population I was studying never leave their mothers. And again, you will, if you watch my TEDx talk, you'll hear about that. They actually live with their mothers the whole lives. They don't mate with her, they don't mate with their sisters, but they live with their mothers and socialize with their sisters for their entire lives. They leave periodically and for very short periods of time to mate with unrelated females and then they come home to their mother. And this relationship appears to be mutually beneficial, which is why it evolved and why it's stable. But it is really pretty fascinating because Again, just like the menopause situation where females um, no longer reproduce but continue to live and have value to the social group, um, this males living with their mothers, the sons living with their mothers their whole life is very rare in the animal kingdom, you know, and again, maybe only human beings do it as well. Uh, what made me interested in studying orcas? Well, I was just, um, um, I was about 13 and I was watching um, a TV special that had Jacques Cousteau on it. And he was out there on the Calypso, in the Calypso, his boat, and he was um, sailing around and dolphins, I think they were common dolphins, came to um, play at the bow of the boat. And I just said to me, I lived in Michigan, uh, not well, Wisconsin at the time. Um, I was born in Michigan. And so I lived in the Midwest and I was watching this special and these dolphins were playing at the bow of the boat and I just said, I want to do that. I want to watch these dolphins in the wild and study them and learn about them and all of that, which my parents thought was really cute because I lived in Wisconsin. But um, when I went to graduate school, I was looking for a project that would involve whales or dolphins, and there was an orca project that was um, ongoing. And you know, one of the graduate students that was leading it was was going to graduate, and so I ended up inheriting it, and I did my graduate work there, and um, and that's how I ended up studying orcas in particular, um, was because uh, I was very interested in whales and dolphins, and that project was available. Um, have I come in contact with an orca? Well, 
I spent five years in the field with them, and um, of course we don't get up close and personal with wild orcas. You know, we, we study them from a respectful distance. Um, but at one point, um, I actually was very, very close to a wild orca because um, the coast where I was studying them is very abrupt. It's rocky because um, the coast where I was studying them is very abrupt. It's rocky and it has very um, sharp drop off, you know, because it was uh, glaciated and the glaciers came through and cut through these um, straits and, and bodies of water. So I was on a place called Johnstone Strait, which had been formed by glacier. And so the drop off is quite sheer. It's about 60, 60 degrees. And so I was standing on a rock on the shore and this orca was just off the shore, but was able to come very, very close to the rocks because of how deep it was where she was. And um, we, were, we were pretty close to each other, and we were looking at each other. I could actually see her eye, and we were, we were thinking about each other. It was kind of fascinating. Um, how many orcas are usually in one pod? It totally depends on whether they're fish eaters or mammal eaters, and how big the population is, and how successful the females in that group have been, and so on. So there's no um, set number, but in fish eaters, they're bigger groups because, you know, they each get, you know, a fish and you saw the herring ball in that one photograph, there's lots of fish for everybody. So they can afford, if you will, they can afford to live in bigger groups and actually are more efficient at foraging and forming those herring balls, for example, if they are in a big, bigger group. And so you might see a pod, that they're just all members, members of the same family, um, of 20 to 30 individuals at one time, in a, and you might see a super pod of 100 animals all at once. Um, mammal eaters tend to travel in smaller groups because a single seal isn't going to feed that many individuals if they catch it. So they need to stay in a smaller group so that everybody gets enough food. Um, and th and then in that case, we might be talking about three to seven individuals. And that doesn't mean that that's how big the family is. The family could be just as big as a fish eating family, but they've broken up into groups of three to seven individuals so that they can hunt more efficiently. Um, could a captive bred orca survive in the wild? After everything I've told you about how cultural they are and how much they have to learn to be a successful orca, I think you know the answer to that. The answer is no. It's highly unlikely that a captive-born orca who has nothing but artificial culture, captive culture, that's all they know, um, could learn, you know, how can we teach them to be good wild orcas, you know, efficient, competent wild orcas. We're really lousy orcas. You know, we don't know how to live as an orca. We only know how to live as human beings. So if we're the ones who are teaching them, we're likely not to teach them enough or, or well enough. And so it's highly unlikely that they would ever become competent to take care of themselves out there in the wild. The long-term captive animals, I don't know. Um, they were born in the wild. They lived in the wild um, for some period of time. And then they were put into a concrete box and, and lost that culture. Would they remember it? I don't know. The orcas that have been caught in Russia that have only been in captivity for a few months now, there was 11 orcas I mentioned, I actually think they can be returned to their families as long as somebody who remembers them is still alive. Because remember, I told you some orcas are killed in these captures, so maybe their mother was killed. But if their brothers or their sisters or their aunts are still alive, it's quite probable that they could just be returned after only a few months after all. Um, they would wonder where they've been. But they would, I think, um, reintegrate into that family group fairly easily. Um, the belugas, we don't know enough about their social structure, so we don't know whether they could reintegrate into their social structure, into their family groups, into their populations very successfully. We don't know. Um, but the orcas, I think they could, because it's family that they're returning to, and the family would remember them. Um, we've seen this happen. There were a couple of rescues of orcas in the Pacific Northwest. Um, one of which um, had been found alone. Her mother probably died. Um, she was rehabilitated in a, a sea pen. So she was actually just like these orcas in Russia in a sea pen for a while, separated from her family. And then she was taken back to her family and released into that family. And she's still alive today. That was 10 years ago or so. And she's still alive today. She's had offspring. She's successful. And so we know that it happened once. We're pretty sure it can happen again. So we'll see what happens to those 11 orcas in Russia. And finally, let's see where are we are. We're going to link some of these suggested videos you mentioned to our web page. Great, thank you. Um, and I did answer the question about whether I've come in close contact with an orca out in the wild. Yes, um, of course, in captivity, I've 
visited many, many facilities. I've watched lots and lots of captive orcas and captive cetaceans. Um, it's part of my job to do that. <laughs> Why do people hold orcas captive? Because they can make a lot of money. Um, that might seem a little harsh, but it's true. It's a commercial venture. Um, that's why the capture operators in Russia are doing what they're doing. They get a lot of money per orca. Um, a single orca can be worth five to ten million dollars. It is an, it's like it's like the drug trade. The wildlife trade is as lucrative as the drug trade. There, and not, I'm not just talking about orcas. I'm talking about all wildlife. Um, the reason we're losing rhinos, the reason we're losing elephants, is because the trade and their parts and their products, like their tusks and their horns is incredibly lucrative and live orcas are worth a lot of money. You know, people will pay a lot of money to see them perform. I, I, I wish that wasn't true. It's why we're working on the demand side. We're trying to teach people not to want that, but that's a that's a long term thing. How many children does a typical orca produce? That's a really good question. Um, they start giving birth successfully at about 14, 15 years of age, maybe a couple years earlier. Um, and then they have this is a female. And then they have one calf per every, on average, five years. And they go through menopause around 40. So if you do the math, they might have five to six um, calves in a lifetime. And if they're really, really good moms, maybe all of them will survive. If they're not, you know, maybe half of them will survive. And really, all she needs is one to survive, to replace herself, or two to replace herself and the, and the father. A male, how many calves will a male father in his lifetime? We have no idea. It might be a lot, you know, 20, 30, something like that. And what do killer whales need to survive? They, in my opinion, they need space, they need their families, they need um, healthy and lots of food, and they need a clean environment. And the last one, clean environment, is obviously something we all need to work on, where, you know, the, the natural habitat is being um, damaged by our activities, but space, family, and food, most orcas have. There's a couple places, like I said, in, in Washington State where they're missing the food part. They're, they're, they're starving to death, literally, because their primary prey, which is Chinook salmon, is in decline. But all orcas have, in, in natural habitat have space and family. Without those two things, space and family, which is the big things they're missing in captivity, I think they suffer a lot. And why are they called killer whales? Well, because they killed other whales. They were whale killers. Um, orcas have been seen very efficiently to hunt the largest animal that ever lived, the blue whale. And um, whalers or mariners, any kind of mariner back in the day, would watch these um, orcas, these killer whales, kill whales, be whale killers. And so they ended up being called killer whales. Um, and then as time passed, and in fact, we brought them into captivity and learned that they weren't just mindless killers, but they were very intelligent and very social, um, we started calling them orcas, which is their species name. They are sinus orca, or sinus is their genus, orca is their species. Have any captive orcas been reintroduced to the wild? Um, Keiko, the orca that starred in the movie Free Willy in 1993, there was an attempt to return him to the wild. And while he never became independent, he actually lived for more than five years in natural habitat. He was basically retired to a sanctuary and lived for more than five years active and engaged in his natural habitat. And so that is one of the reasons why we are now pursuing the idea of establishing seaside sanctuaries to retire these captive whales because we are concerned they can't survive competently on their own in the wild. But they need more space. They need better circumstances. So seaside sanctuaries, very similar to what Keiko had for the last five years of his life, we're pursuing those options because we think that's the future for these captive whales that can't live on their own. And thank you. And I think that's it. It's now 4 o'clock. Thank you, everybody. I really had a great time. And thank you for your questions. They were great.